Uh, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Hannah New and I'm the marketing manager for the University of Utah Press. Uh, today we are doing a virtual book launch for the book, An Architectural Travel Guide to Utah. Uh, please keep your mics muted. There'll be time at the end for questions. Uh, feel free to use the chat feature at any time for questions and I will moderate them uh, for uh, Dr. Evans later. So with us today is the author, Martha Bradley Evans and the director of the press, Glenda Cotter. Glenda Cotter started working at the University of Utah Press in 1990, following her graduation from the University of Utah with an MA in art history. She has been the director of the press since 2009. Dr. Martha Bradley Evans is a professor in the College of Architecture and Planning. She served as the Dean of the Honors College from 2002 to 2011, and in July 2011 became the Senior Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of Undergraduate Studies. An award-winning teacher, she is the recipient of the Utah University of Utah Distinguished Teaching Award, the University Professorship, the Student Choice Excellent in Teaching Award, the Benyon Center Service Learning Professorship, and the Sweet Candy Honors Distinguished Professor Award. She was made a fellow of the Utah State Historical Society in 2013. She has served as the vice chair of the Utah State Board of History, chair of the Utah Heritage Foundation, and is on the board of trustees of Envision Utah. Her books include Kidnap from That Land, The Government Raids on the Short Creek Polygamous, The Four Zenas, Mother and Daughters on the Frontier, Pedestals and Podiums, Utah Women, Religious Authority and Equal Rights, and Glorious in Persecution, Joseph Smith, American Prophet, 1839 to 1844. In 2020, uh, Bradley Evans received the Rosenblatt Prize, the highest honor given to a faculty member by the University of Utah. All right, Glenda, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Hannah. As was mentioned, uh, my name is Glenda Cotter and I'm the director of the University of Utah Press. And we're here today to talk with author Martha Bradley Evans about her new book, An Architectural Travel Guide to Utah. Welcome, Marty. Thank you so much for joining us today. She's trying to hold it up, but it doesn't work very well on those, on our green screens. <laughs> so it, it's a big book and it just became available. And I'll tell you a little bit at the end about how you can get it. Uh, many people at the press worked with you on the book, Marty, and I feel very lucky that I got to be part of that process. This book is just a massive accomplishment, and we're so proud to have published it with you, and congratulations to you on publication. Thank you, Glenda. I know the book has been a long time in the making as you've traveled around the state doing research and taking photographs in your spare time. I'm going to make sure I get the scare quotes in there uh, because you've had so many duties at the University of Utah. But how many, I'm wondering how many years you spent visiting the sites around the state as you prepared the book manuscript. So I, um, I became a committed explorer decades ago, I have to say. When I, when I was thinking about um, today and what, how I would share my love of the state and its built environment with all of you, I could remember uh, one of my very first trips where I was really noticing the built environment was when I was working on the history of Z ZCMI and I was traveling around to find all the co-ops co I could in the state. And I remember first seeing the Ephraim Co-op and it's really a magnificent building. If you haven't seen it, you need to drive to Sam Peak County and make sure you see the Ephraim Co-op and Granary are two of the most interesting 19th century buildings you could see. Um, but from that trip, that initial trip, and then literally, you know, probably a hundred other trips since then, I've explored every corner of the state but always with an eye um, towards the built environment. It's a long time is the answer, <laughs> decades. 
Well, do you want to tell us a little bit more about any of these journeys or would you like to reminisce for a minute about some favorite memories you have from your trips? Sure, absolutely. Um, and another, uh, another venture that um, inspired journeys to different parts of the state was being one of the authors for some of the county histories in the 1990s. And some of you on this call, I know were also authors. Um, it was such an extraordinary experience to, I, I worked on Kane and Beaver, two really different places, and I was a co-author on Summit. But if you think about heading in those three different directions many times, because at that moment in time, the newspapers were not digitized. You had to go to the Kanab library and read hard copies of all the historic uh, newspapers. But uh, in each of those county histories, I spent a lot of time driving from town to town and trying to figure out what was going on in each of those places and talking to dozens and dozens of people about the places they lived. So, so in the 90s, I was doing a lot of this driving um, and exploring as well. Um, I, I think there are a few though, day-long drives that I would encourage you to take. And uh, I know I'm a total eccentric, I totally admit this, but sometimes early in the morning, I'll think, you know, I don't wanna stay home and do yard work. I'm going on a drive and I'll jump in my car and then I'll drive for the next 12 hours. And here are some of the most memorable ones. The most recent one I did was I, I drove south, you know, and usually when you think about driving south, you would stop in Provo and you do all of that, right? But I took kind of the back route um, and, I, and I went to Eureka and I saw the mining districts around the Tintic mining area. I went to Mammoth, which is a really interesting place. So it's just nestled into the foothills near um, a historic mining district. Um, but then I went to Deseret and Millard and Juab, all of these tiny little kind of worn, <clears throat> worn out towns um, towards the, the uh, west of the traditional I-15 journey down the road. And then I swung around and I drove towards Price. And if you've ever gone to Price, I mean, Price itself is just a gold mine of really wonderful, interesting buildings. Price was far more ethnically diverse than most parts of the state because of the miners who immigrated to work there. But when you're going towards Price, you have to stop at Helper. Helper, it, it's just this teeny tiny little exit and you swing under the, uh, under the freeway, the highway. And then it's like a strip city that just runs along the base of, of the mountain range. Um, but it's one of the most interesting, in fact, I might even have a, I'm gonna change my backdrop so you can see it. Um, it's one of the most interesting little towns you can visit in the state of Utah. Uh, in August, they have a arts fest festival. They have one of the most significant uh, modern buildings, uh, early modern buildings. It's a streamlined uh, um, art modern building for their civic, civic hall. They also have a group of houses. It was a, it was a company town. So there are a group of, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> there, there's a group of houses that miners would have used. Uh, and then there's this wonderful main street and I love it so much. And I'm sorry that this photo flipped when I made it my backdrop, but do you love the way the mountain range is right behind the, the main street? So you get a sense of, of this enterprise that this town represented. And um, there are so many storefront commercial block buildings that are intact. Many of them have wall murals. You can see that the, the signs were painted on the side of, of the wall. And whenever you find those, you should for sure pull out your camera because they're more and more rare. Um, I love it when you see one that, there's one in Moroni, for example, that says ZCMI over unders. Uh, ZCMI for a while had a factory where they produced overalls and undergarments, underwear, um, thick <laughs> underwear. Um, and you'll sometimes see those signs on the sides of buildings throughout the state. That's 
one of the things you should always be watching for. But be sure and go through helper. You can do all of this in a day um, down through price. You can look for the buckcorn flats lime kiln, which is on the backside of, cap of uh, the San Rafael swell. And one of the most profound and interesting natural spaces that you could possibly visit. It's so incredibly beautiful. Uh, when I last went to try and find the lime kiln, I, I was so conscious that I was probably the only person within 10, 20 miles. It's very, very desolate. But it actually was really exhilarating to be there because you, you get this profound sense of this sublime landscape and then this sort of minuscule evidence of human beings on the land. It reminds you that, that we are of the earth and that relationship um, between what we build and what we try and do in the, in the land is it's a really fine line. So that's a really fun one. I love driving north. Um, you know, many times for my, my day job, I've had to go to meetings up at Utah State, but I hardly ever just go to the meeting. <laughs> I always have taken advantage of meetings that are held on other campuses as a way of exploring the landscape around them. And um, I, I think the Cache Valley is one of the most beautiful places on the earth, let alone in the state of Utah. And for me, it all begins when you come down Sardine Canyon, which is just sometimes in the winter death defying, right? You come down through Sardine Canyon and this huge expanse of the Cache Valley opens in front of you. Um, I, I think that five minute feeling that you feel when you come out of the canyon into that expanse of this beautiful agricultural land is worth driving an hour and a half just to experience. It's so beautiful. But then you have all these little towns to explore, Providence and Wellsville, um, and the really uh, pristine little gems of 19th century villages. Uh, the Wellsville Tabernacle, for, for example, it's a really provincial building, but it's but you can tell what it's aspiring to be. You know, it's, it's a building that's that wishes it was grander, and so it has the it, it has the outline, the signature of a grander building, but less grand materials. Um, and I love that kind of building because it gives you a sense of the story of the place. That these were people who knew what grand churches looked like, and they designed it and built it that way. But they didn't have the material wealth to make it as grand as something they might have seen when they lived in the east. So you go through those tiny little towns and then you hit uh, Logan and Logan has architectural gems like you can't even imagine. The uh, Logan Tabernacle and the Logan Temple are extraordinarily beautiful buildings uh, built by Truman, designed by Truman Angel and his son Truman Angel Jr. Uh, they represented the high point of LDS architecture during the 19th century. And they're built of this beautiful gray limestone from the hills nearby. Uh, one of the things you'll see as you drive through Utah and you, and you begin this explorer way of being is you'll notice that there are indigenous features to, to the architecture. And one that is one of my favorite things to track is the use of different kinds of stone. So in Logan, the stone is gray. In Sam Peak County, the stone is cream. Uh, in St. George, some of you may be familiar with the St. George Tabernacle, it's sandstone. It's red. It's red like the hills surrounding St. George. So that's how I use the term indigenous, that these buildings are of a particular place. And again, reminding us of that, that we depend on the earth and the environment around us for our sustenance. And you see that play out in terms of architecture. But don't stop at Logan, even though it has just remarkable gems. The main street is just so much fun. Uh, the temple barn up by the uh, Logan Temple is another really wonderful stone building to explore. But keep driving because there are a series, there are more small, beautiful little rural villages past Logan. So for example, Smithfield, uh, Garland, Lewiston, those towns each have their own architectural gems. 
Um, one of my, um, and I imagine at some point I'll be asked to talk about my favorite buildings. And for me, they're almost always these kind of aha moments, you know? Uh, so in one of my drives past Logan, I, had, I felt like I'd been driving through tens of uh, thousands of miles. No, it was only a, a, like 20 minutes of, of a drive from one town to another. When I came upon the Lewiston Cooperative and Granary, and it was just surrounded by these beautiful agricultural fields. And then this beautiful, simple two-story red brick. Uh, it's actually an Italianate building, which was usually reserved for, um, for uh, residential architecture. But for me, the site was so, it, it contributed to this sense of wonder I felt when I saw it. It was like, it was so far away from anything else. And it was so pristine. It was in such great condition. And coming upon it in that way was just extraordinary. But the Cache Valley has some of the very best Carnegie libraries. They have uh, New Deal era PWA civic buildings. You know, it's just really jam after jam after jam. And that doesn't even count the churches, the meeting houses, the churches, the tabernacles, which in that valley are really beautiful. And some of them are really quite, quite magnificent. So that's a great, a great uh, drive as well. And I, I'll mention one more drive. And I should say this book is not organized like a series of walking tours. But it, it clusters architecture and built environments by region more. You know, you could certainly choose to explore the avenues or choose to explore downtown Salt Lake City or downtown Provo and move through it that way. And that would be a fun way of doing it. But I would also encourage you to leave Salt Lake City and explore other regions of the state and use that. This is a sort of guide in that way. But another uh, one time years ago, I was at the Mormon History Association meeting in Provo and I got up like a good conference goer and went to one session. And then I thought, I am so close to Spanish Fork. I'm going on a little drive. <laughs> so I, I actually backtracked a little bit and drove through Highland and Alpine and then through Pleasant Grove and American Grove and through some of the uh, areas of Provo, which I like a lot. And then I drove to Spanish Fork and I came upon a building you all need to track down. It's the Hare Krishna Temple. It's called the Lotus Temple. It's right, out, right, right outside of Spanish Fork. And it's so not at all like anything else you will have experienced to that point in time. It's, it's another one of those buildings like the Lewiston Cooperative was for me where you come upon it and it's just like, oh my gosh. And for me, those moments when I do this kind of exploration and driving and exploring, it just fills me up. I mean, I just get filled with joy. And I know that, that you all, if you do these kinds of trips, will, will have that experience as well. Um, so don't just do the predictable Center Street in Provo, Main Street in Salt Lake City, but venture out. And, you know, the drive is a really important part of it. You know, when I'm on these drives through our state, I'm always super conscious of the ancient inhabitants of this place. Um, our landscape in Utah is so incredibly varied, isn't it? And when you, when you drive by Red Rock or, I mean, look at the view behind you, Glenda, you know, that is a sublime, profoundly simple landscape. But I always think about the ancient inhabitants of the land. And I recognize that um, the Shoshone and the Paiute and the Goshute and the Utes, they, this is their traditional and ancestral land. And I always try to imagine the lives that they had on the, line, the land, trying to find water, trying to find food. If you've ever visited any of their, uh, the sites, um, of their cave dwellings, for example, you can see that they were just seeking uh, sh shelter. 
you know, they obviously had to fight weather in the same way that we do. I mean, we're, I've been kind of whiny about the wind today, but think about wind when you're living in this harsh desert landscape and how important a, a rock wall would be to you at that moment in time. So I, wanna, I wanted to acknowledge that I recognize and respect the enduring relationship native people have with land and that each successive wave of settlement has really, uh, we've been interlopers on what already existed. Um, and uh, I think we need to pay, pay our respect um, uh, to that as we explore. Thank you, Marty. I've got to tell you, I picked up the book while you were talking. It's in my hands. You've got me ready to go hop in my car as soon as we're done. <laughs> This is a gorgeous time of year, and I've been making notes as you talk, uh, you know, places that I haven't paid enough attention to that I need to now go visit. I'm going to look for the painted sign in Morona. I know I love those, and I've stopped in many small towns. Nephi has some fun ones, but Helper, isn't it a higgledy-piggledy sign or something like that yeah, in Helper? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, those are the, this state is just so rich if you get off the beaten track and, and explore it a little bit. I, I know one of my favorite, my daughter and I make it, try to make an annual trip to St. George. And I love just driving out of St. George and into Santa Clara mm -hmm. and that main street in Santa Clara. As you say, it just gives me joy when I drive, when I drive into Santa Clara and see that absolutely priceless little town. So thank well, you a, for- a beautiful <laughs> example of our Relief Society Hall mm -hmm. and a tithing, uh, a tithing office granary. Uh, Santa Clara is another really pristine place. I think it's very special. If you ever go to St. George, make sure you drive over to Santa Clara. And the other I would add to that, uh, since you are willing to veer out of St. George, is drive the distance to Pine Valley. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I've driven to Pine Valley, almost every time I've done that, I've thought, I am so lost, I'm not going anywhere. Because the road is very narrow and it kind of feels like you're going up someone's ranch driveway for a little bit of the way. But when you get to Pine Valley, it's this extraordinarily beautiful place. Uh, it's, it's alpine. Much of the pine that was used for construction in Washington County came from Pine Valley. But there's this huge agricultural field. And then along the edge of your view, you see all these trees and just little hints of buildings. And the closer you drive, uh, the most important building that you see is the Pine Valley Meeting House. And it's one of those buildings that, you know, and it's partly because you had to work so hard to get there. And when you get there, it's like, da-da! <laughs> it's this really simple little meeting house with a really grand Baroque staircase that leads up to the entrance, um, just made out of wood. Um, but really beautiful, just a testimony to the endurance and the strength and resilience of the generation of, of settlers who built um, homes, made that beautiful valley their home. Well, I, I don't even know. I, I'm going to veer off the questions that I had for you, uh, but... <coughs> Partly because, and I'm going to mention that the book has 275 photographs in it, and most of them are your photographs that you've taken as you've traveled around. And if for no other reason than just having a photographic, uh, sorry, I didn't get enough sleep last night. My brain is, freezes up a little bit. But a photographic record of all these wonderful examples of architecture around the building. Just for that reason, this book I think is really priceless, especially as we lose more and more of the older buildings in the state. Mm -hmm. So I think you've done an important service by helping preserve the memory, if nothing else, of some of these places. So thank you for that. But in a book of this size and scope, I know there have to be many decisions and trade-offs as you're deciding what to include, what to exclude. 
Uh, I mean, you've included examples of daring contemporary architecture, such as the Salt Lake Public Library, mm -hmm. and then the small adobe, red adobe church in Grafton, which is, I mean, diff totally different poles of architecture. So are there any buildings that you didn't have room to include, but you wish you could have, or that you would particularly like to encourage people to visit? Well, you know, um, we, we mostly stopped at the historic time period, which would be 50 years ago from now. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Um, Symphony Hall was a really prominent exception. But most of them are buildings that we consider to be historic. There, are, there is so much outstanding contemporary architecture now that could be included in a, another book that focused on contemporary architects and their, and their work. So, you know, so many of the architects I deeply admire and who've, who've really made a difference in terms of up in the ante on our buildings. Um, I was thinking this weekend that many really beautiful um, architecturally designed buildings are on our college campuses. Utah State, University of Utah, most of the best architects in town have designed significant buildings for our campuses. So, you know, that would be another place to start as well. But the, but the, the at the other end of the scale, and I, and that, and you know, that, that's what I prefer. Um, for example, if you ever go to Panguitch, Panguitch, you know, and we were able to talk about two, two or three buildings in Panguitch. But they had a couple of really terrific um, brick, brick foundries or brick factories. And so as a result, they have a group and it's you know anywhere between 10 and 15 buildings that have some of the most beautiful brickwork in the whole state. I mean, it's worth driving to Penguish just to see the red brick buildings in, in that place. So, you know, out of that larger group, we had to pick the probably the three most important, but the whole group is worth seeing and walking through and thinking about. For example, there's, and this is just a common house, but it's a bungalow that has a combination of stone wall and red brick. And, you know, it's really unusual. It doesn't look like any other bungalow I've ever seen, which in and of itself would make it worthy to be in this, in this book. But you just can't include every house on, a, on the best block in the best city in the whole state, right? So we just had to make choices about which ones would be included and then which ones we would encourage everyone to go and find for themselves. And, I think the intent is to have a certain mini blog on the website where we'll include many of those images. And if you have images of other buildings you think need to be included, we'll put them there with descriptions and, and give you the chance to uh, find treasures of your own. It doesn't need to all be dictated by me. <laughs> now, Mar Marty and I have talked about Certainly, uh, Panguitch is a good example of a place where we had to exclude many really fine architectural examples. And so we've talked about putting together just you know, a small article with lots of photos, uh, a little PDF that will be available on our website at some point. It's not there yet, but yeah, we would love to, I think this would be an opportunity to uh, add to the available information is to include a few articles on our website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, we will do that. Well, you brought up a question that has interested me about Utah architecture, because there are many small towns around the state that seem to have a sort of architectural integrity to them, places like Midway in Wasatch County, Panguitch, as you mentioned, Spring City, um, actually Farmington has a lot of rock right. houses. Right. And how, how do you account for the unusual qualities of this town where there seems to be really an unusual amount of architectural integrity in some of these places? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's different for each of the towns. And this, this is, uh, behind me is the image of the Spring City Tabernacle, which is one of my 
favorite buildings in the state. It's so beautiful. And, and do you remember when I talked about the cream colored stone? This is oolite limestone. It's used for most of the prominent public buildings. Um, and you can see that on the this building, the stones are carefully cut. They're ashlar masonry, carefully cut. On many of the other buildings you'll see, it's just sort of random masonry where there are lots of different size stones that are connected with mortar. Um, but this one is just so pristine and beautiful. Um, Spring City, when, whenever I've taught uh, Utah architecture, I always bring my class down to Spring City for the day. Um, and I think Mark St. Andreas on this call, he'll remember going there with, with our class. Um, and the reason why is, is the closest thing I think we have in the entire state to a 19th century rural village. Uh, most of the really key architectural types are included in the vo built vocabulary of this very beautiful little town that, that it was laid out along the lines of the plot of the city of Zion. So it's a grid and there's a town square in the middle, which is where this uh, tabernacle is located. There's a really, really unique building called the James Allred Schoolhouse, which um, is, it, it's again, it's a stone building. It's just a really simple rectangle. Um, there are lovely houses throughout the town that are uh, preserved um, more and more today by artists. So it's got a sort of art vibe going on in Spring City. It has a few commercial front buildings that are always really fun to see. Um, you know, the, the original streets un, under the plot of the city of Zion were 132 feet wide, but in Spring City, Spring City is a really tiny town. The sides are, have grass that have grown so that the usable part of the street is much na more narrow. It's just two lanes. But the original concept for that town was that it would grow and be a, a much larger town eventually. I think the fact that it never really grew past a certain point is part of why it's preserved so intact. Uh, it's a little off the, off the beaten path. You know, if you're driving from Manti, uh, Mount Pleasant to Ephraim to Manti, it's off that main highway. You have to choose to go around this loop to get there but it's, it's one of my very favorite places in the whole state to go. And I think it's because it, you know, for a historian and someone who kind of lives in her head, this is the perfect place for me to be because I'm imagining, you know, the way they worked that land and, and went to meeting or uh, socialized as neighbors and it really gives you that sense. Uh, Farmington, and that's a really different example, isn't it? Because it's a, it's, it has all these elements and they're so beautifully preserved. There are many really beautiful stone houses and, and a meeting house in Farmington that are well worth seeing. They're really close. That's not even a day drive. That is a half hour to see all of it. But suburbia has taken over a lot of the edges of it. So they're intermixed with track houses and subdivisions and but I think because of the historical reverence for what they represent, uh, people have really treated them well and preserved them. And there's a real sentimental attachment among the people in Farmington to their rock houses. I think they're very proud of that heritage. Um, <clears throat> I, I was thinking of, about this book, you know, even though this book describes more than 600 individual sites, What's really more important about it is that it tells a story. It tells the story of this state's history, but also about individuals who built homes and went to churches and built schools. And, you know, I think the narrative part of it is what I'd really like to stay with you all if you if you give it a chance, because it's really telling this, it, it's telling a story using physical visual evidence to build the argument about a way of life in the past. Yeah, it's, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to mute. My neighbors have decided to start tearing off their roof today and there's suddenly lots of noise <laughs> in my background. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do think the architecture, I think you're right about the narrative because the architectural examples give us a way to move around the state 
and be aware of what we're seeing and uh, what people were doing in different places. And I think that's really valuable. You mentioned just a little bit, and this is one thing I wanna go back to because it has intrigued me, but uh, the many Carnegie libraries that are found in small towns across the state, I didn't realize how many that there actually are in the state. And there's, I was struck by styles that are very similar from town to town, as well as styles that are totally different than anything else that you could see. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those Carnegie libraries, maybe how many were built in the state, um, how many are still in use. Uh, for those who don't know what the whole idea behind the Carnegie libraries was, I mean, they were such an aspect of serving the greater good. And that, that's always really intrigued me about mm -hmm. them. And are they similar or different from buildings that you see in other states? Are our Carnegie libraries different than something you would see in Nebraska, for instance? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great question. And um, Carnegie libraries are, you know, it's a category of gems in our state. And in most of the cities um, where they where they were built, they've been preserved really beautifully and, they, and they're still community hubs uh, of significant. Um, so you've all heard of Andrew Carnegie. Uh, he was the sort of epitome of the rags to riches tale. He was a poor immigrant kid who made it made it big in the steel industry. And he was an extraordinarily public-minded person. And the Carnegie Foundation came up with this idea that they would help fund the building of, of libraries for small rural communities. And it, you know, these aren't big city libraries. These are libraries for smaller parts of, of rural America. Um, and the, the Carnegie Foundation funded, I think it's like 1,650 libraries in total across the country. I mean, really significant uh, amount of philanthropy around this. But in the state of Utah, we built 23. And the process was, and, and I'll, I'll tell you the story of one of my favorites, and it's in Mount Pleasant. Uh, the, so Mount Pleasant had already started a lending library. So they had this base of interest in sharing books. And when they heard of this opportunity, they applied for a grant from the Carnegie Foundation. And typically the grants that the Carnegies would give would be anywhere between 10,000 and 13,000. So pretty modest. But the idea was that if you got the money from the Carnegie to help you build the library, the town had to commit to paying ongoing maintenance and other expenses that were incurred. The library in Mount Pleasant was designed by Scott and Welch, a really well-known uh, architectural firm from Salt Lake City. Another building you might be familiar with that they designed is the Masonic Temple, uh, which is one of my top 10 buildings. I think it's really, really an interesting building. Um, but because they, I mean, they were really talented um, architectural pair. Uh, it's a beautiful prairie style building. <coughs> Carnegie libraries are typically built up so that the basement level has full windows. So the basements are, this lower level is as light as the upper level. Um, it has beautiful red brick walls and um, off-white uh, accent, accents on the horizontal lines, a flat roof. It's right in the center of town. It's across the street from the National Guard Armory, which was a PWA project uh, a number of years later, but hugely important, still in use. You can go and sit, sit in that beautiful building and, and read read magazines, read books. The, I think I mentioned in that uh, Cache County ride that if you go to Smithfield, Garland, and Richmond, they have three really beautiful Carnegie libraries in those towns. I first went to the Smithfield library in the, what, the late 
1880, I mean, 1980s, not quite that old. Uh, and the, I was writing an article about a, a Utah architect, a woman named Mary Teasdale. Mary Teasdale, some of you may have heard of the art missionaries who did some of the murals in the LDS temple in Salt Lake City. She also went to Paris to study painting and came back and she was heavily influenced by Marie Cassatt. And she mostly did really tiny little paintings but the Smithfield Library has dozens of them. And every once in a while, they put them on exhibit. And so I, I first saw that library, which was is so wonderful, um, uh, when I went up there to look at uh, the paintings, which is, again, one of the reasons why it's worth going up there. The, the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other, uh, the other thing I mentioned just briefly that there are also PWA buildings in that part of Cache County. Let me talk to you a little bit about that because this is another really important outside influence on what we did in the state. Uh, during the New Deal, during the Depression, Utah was hit hard. And when the Depression first started, we had like 25% unemployment. But by 1933, we had 33% unemployment. Can you imagine? And that's because we were so dependent on agricultural markets and mining markets and all of that was just, you know, it, it came to a standstill. So one of the really important New Deal programs that impacted the state of Utah was the Works Progress Administration. And one of the programs under the WPA was the PW. PWA, and what it was, what it intended to do was to put worked men to work who were unemployed, and at the same time building the infrastructure of America. So a PWA building, for example, one of my very favorite PWA uh, buildings is the Manti County Courthouse, um, the Sampi County Courthouse. It's it's a style that we call PWA modern which is a really streamlined, flattened, has some classical elements, um, really, really simple and austere compared to the more elaborate buildings around it. Um, but uh, we, we, we built more than 200 PWA buildings. And you can imagine for rural Utah, that had a huge impact on the infrastructure. It was sometimes high schools, sometimes mu municipal halls, uh, other kinds of public buildings. But the PWA poured a lot of money into the state of Utah. And when it was all over, we, we had these pretty significant buildings in every part of the state. I uh, went to high school in Springville, so I'm super familiar with the now Springville Museum of Art and that being a WPA building yeah, as well. Yeah. And the mechanical high school building right next to it is also a PWA. Okay, and I'm totally intrigued by that building as part of a high school building, but I am cognizant of the fact that we are running out of time and I know audience members have questions and so I'm going to have to just skip all kinds of questions that I have for you. Um, the one that I'm really regretting, so I'm gonna read the question and if you have time to address this, fine if you don't. But there, when I think about the architectural landscape of Salt Lake City in particular, uh, I'm struck by four historic buildings that as much as any others kind of help define the city those being the LDS Temple, the City County Building, the Cathedral of the Madeline, and of course the State Capitol. All very different, but all very striking in the city. What do you think buildings like that tell us about the history of, of the, the history of and the aspirations people had for Utah's capital city? So I think from the very first when uh, Mormon settlers came to Utah, they intended for Salt Lake City to be a center place. And even though there were temples throughout the state that were built first, the Salt Lake Temple was the principal focus of those building efforts. 
and you know it, it it played out over a very significant period of time. I think it's four decades uh, before it was finally finished. But the spot was identified in the, you know in one of the corners of Temple Square, uh, the Salt Lake Tabernacle next door to it. That combination of those two buildings, they're two of the most noticeable historical architectural landmarks in the valley. And you know it wasn't until maybe ten years after the Mormons first settled here that they built a wall around Temple Square. Um, it was built through a public works project, which was a way of putting together immigrants or uh, settlers who had come to the Utah Valley and had no money. They could earn money working on, on the wall. <coughs> Excuse me. But from the first, it was intended to be a center place. And everything, um, augmented that reality, right? The street system starts from the southeast corner. So all roads lead to Rome, if you want to say it that way. Um, many of the decisions about how the whole rest of the state would be settled by this group <clears throat> were made within a block of Temple Square. So there was this visual centrality and, and physicality of that centrality that was really significant. I love to ask my students to think about the play between Temple Square and the site behind me and the state capitol or the city and county building. If you think about it, uh, in, in, in the, the Latter-day Saint way of settling a place, they would first of all inscribe the land with what they call the plot of the city of Zion with a strong center place, roads that ran at right angles to each other, right? And usually in a town like Beaver or Spring City, the, the church or a temple was in the, cent the literal center of the place. And in Salt Lake City, it's not in the literal center. <clears throat> the, um, so the siding of the state capitol and the city and county building, they're so interesting because they, they, they compete for that centrality and they compete in different ways. I, I love the way this, the state capitol is up on a hill, you know? So even though the tabernacle and the, and the temple are really, really important buildings and, you know, views from everywhere point to them, the, the state capitol claims this, it's not just centrality, it's like in a hierarchy of things, a more important position. The city and county building, on the other hand, which is further on down the road, it's actually in a more central place. And the conversation between the city and county building and the Scott Matheson courthouse, and now, and I would add to your list of four buildings, the Salt Lake Public Library, I mean, it creates this conversation about um, how do we live a life based on rules and laws rather than religion or the rule of will. Um, so there's this really interesting dialogue going on about the relationship between church and state and what's more important than another and who has more power than others. And it just, it's so rich in terms of teaching because you, the students can see it and they can start thinking about architecture in really different ways. So I love, I love playing with that sort of thing. I love that, Marty. That's, that's perfect. Well, thank you so much. It's been a joy for me to talk to you about this today. Uh, I'm going to turn this back over to Hannah for questions that audience members might have had. I know she's put in the chat some information about how to order the book, so please check that out, and it will also be available at local bookstores soon, but thank you, Marty. This thank has you. been great. Thank you. Yes, uh, please support your local bookstores. Um, I'm going to start with uh, this one. What uh, area of the state uh, do you think has the most unique architecture? You know, um, another place that I would encourage you to visit is Copperton out on the west bench of the Salt Lake Valley. And it actually has some of the most unusual architecture in the state. Uh, Copperton was first settled as a company town. So it has a big company community center. And then it has a series of houses and they're, they're pretty small. I mean, they're smaller than 1500 square feet. So they're modest sized houses. 
but many of them have a copper feature. So for example, there might be one, and ima imagine how big a 1500 square feet house is, right? This is as big as most of our apartments. So it's very small, but then it has a tower. It has this huge tower base and an onion dome that's made out of copper. <laughs> And, and it, it's just, you know, this wonderful street of some of the oddest architecture you can see, but you're just giddy because it's, I love company towns in general because it was a way, it, it, it's not so much trapping the workers, but providing all the support the workers needed. They had their own baseball team. Um, and for a period of time, they lived in the sort of communal company, company way, but it's worth an hour's drive to get out there and explore that, that wonderful street of copper clad buildings. <laughs> Great. Um, here's another one. What is your favorite place to stand and look up? Boy, you know, my family, my family and my friends that I've traveled with would say, I do that everywhere <laughs> because you miss so much from the from the ground plane, right? And you know, if you walk down Main Street, for example, if you were only experiencing buildings on what you could see straight across, you'd be missing all those wonderful stories above you. So you always have to you always have to look up. Um, some of you may have read the wonderful book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I, I love what he says in that book that you see so much more if you're on a motorcycle than in a car because the car is framing what you see. And the same thing is when you walk. I mean, it's worse if you're in a car and you're in an area with skyscrapers, but you, you have to actively engage in the effort to try and see more. And in my mind, that's the whole purpose of this book is for more of you to have this expanded vision, more vocabulary, more opportunities to see things. I like to flip that question upside down and think of where are the best places to see the big view, you know, which is essentially looking down. And I imagine all of you have some favorite viewpoint, but I think the hike up to Ensign Peak is one of the most valuable things you can do. Um, I love doing it with groups of students or friends because everyone sees something I don't see, you know. For me, I'm always looking at patterns and systems and landmarks, all of that. But when I do that with a group of students, they notice things that I've never seen before, regardless of how many times I do it. But you, you just see that you see the larger system from Ensign. You can also see over to the lake and the islands. Right. And you can see the refineries and you can see Davis County. And I love that because you, you really get a sense of the whole picture the big picture and just what an extraordinary uh, place we live in. Yeah, that's good advice. Um, architecturally speaking, uh, what is your favorite building that is no longer standing? And what is your favorite building standing? So the Colville Tabernacle is the one that started many people on the road of historic preservation. And there have been so many buildings like that that have been torn down. Um, I wish I had lived during the time that the Bishop's Storehouse on the corner of North Temple and Main Street still stood, um, because I find that just, I, lo I love the idea of a building existing to help people get settled and situated and give to each other and support each other. And I, I love everything about that building. What was the second part of the question? Uh, what building um, is your favorite still standing? Oh, okay. So I, I don't have just one, <laughs> but I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a number. Um, I, lo I love anything in Spring City. I love the Spring City Tabernacle. I love the uh, railroad depots. I, I get a feeling inside of the Rio Grande Railroad Depot um, or the Union Pacific, especially when it was a freestanding building. <clears throat> Union Station in Ogden, I love 
that sense that this was a gateway for people who sacrificed everything to come here to start a new life. And I, I'm never in that building when I don't think that. I just, th I think of it that way, that it's this huge, I mean, you think about, about places we might go to a dance or a grand ballroom. There are these grand spaces that were the first spaces these immigrants experienced as they came into this new place and then went to Price or wherever to work. Um, but I, lo I love that sense of the gateway that a really great uh, rail railroad station gives us. Yeah, yeah, that is neat. Um, so the last one I have ahead of time, uh, what inspired you to start the book? So my colleague, Peter Goss, inspired me to do this book. And it was originally an idea of Gibbs Smith. Um, Gibbs, uh, his team gave up on the book um, maybe three or four years after I'd been invited to think about it. And then um, University of Utah Press, John Alley, and now Glenda were just so enormously supportive of the uh, concept behind this. and. You know, it's an incredibly complicated enterprise because you need maps and photos and dates and architects names and descriptions and, you know, it just goes on and on. It's an incredibly complicated project. And I can't think, thank Glenda enough for straightening it all out and persevering. And I, I just really think it's going to be something that's going to be so fun for people who really are willing to give it a chance and dig in and open themselves up to more that this place has to offer. Yeah, yeah, I know we're all appreciative of the book. Um, is there anybody in the audience that has a question? Well, uh, you know, can I just say, I love that so many of my old friends, and I mean longtime friends are here. Stephen Smith, my goodness, it is so awesome to see you. And talking about architects who've had a huge impact on this place, Steve Smith for years was engaged in the effort to bring architecture to elementary school kids and to help them think visually and conceptually. And Steve, it's, it's the best thing that happened to me today to have you in this room with us. So thank you. Uh, the other thing I was thinking about, and I see Larry Gerlach is on this call, but one of my very first architectural journeys was when I was a senior in college and I took an experiential learning class called the New England Experience. And a group of English majors and history majors traveled to New England and we all came up with our ideas of what we needed to do. And Gerlach went along with my idea, which was to visit the 10 oldest buildings in New England. So we just did this long drive and went through the John Whipple house and the ceiling seemed like it was about an inch over my head, you know, just that adventure started really early for me and, you know, really wonderful guides and friends along the way, Larry Gerlach, Stephen Smith, and so many, so many others. I, I'm so appreciative of all you've, you've given me. That's great. Thank you. Um, we are actually out of time, so we're gonna um, wrap it up and I'd like to thank uh, Glenda, the director, and uh, Marty for being here and discussing this wonderful book. Um, as Glenda said, it's available on our website and uh, please support your local bookstores. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks again, Marty. Thank you. Thanks for coming, Beth. <laughs>